And uh, we had started uh, talking about uh, bar and wire products and uh, having a look at the technology in a, uh, um, in a mill. And I had told you that uh, if you wanted to um, reduce the section of a billet yeah, um, to make some kind of wire product or rod, um, and you were, you were using a rolling process, uh, you would have to roll in one direction, yes, and then the material would become elliptical, right? And then the thing you do is roll in the other direction. And, and that is why in these uh, uh, rod mails you have stands which are alternatingly horizontal and vertical, yes? And so you can see here, for instance, this is uh, one, this, oops, uh, there's one stand here, there's successive stands, yes? In, in different uh, directions. And uh, this is what these, uh, these typical uh, rolls look in the, uh, in the mill. Okay, so here it's, uh, you can see it even better. You can see here the, the horizontal mill and here the vertical mill. So here, you, here the rolls go in this direction, turn in this uh, direction. Yeah? Whereas uh, here they turn in, in this direction, okay? So you get this alternating horizontal and, and vertical rolls. And, and so as a consequence, the, um, the, um, in, through the roughing train, for instance, um, you get quite a, a, a change in, this, in the section, uh, sectional shape of the product as it gets longer. Hmm? So for instance, this, this is for instance a sequence evolution for uh, starting with a, a billet that's rectangular, and this is what comes out of the, uh, the roughing tray. Hmm? Okay, this is an example here. You can see the section is like X-shaped, okay? Uh, and, and you can see also that um, at each uh, uh, section here it is an other mill stand. So there quite a lot of mill stands, quite a lot of uh, roll shapes uh, in, in these mills that need to be managed very carefully. Because if you mix up mills, uh, roll, uh, rolls in the mill, you have, uh, you know, you, you're going to have problems in achieving the, the right dimensions. Hmm? And, and so uh, multiple passes. Hmm? So take for instance here, a, um, it's a, a bit old um, uh, sequence, but, but you can see, you get the idea. The ingot is section uh, changes, and uh, this is for a bar mill here, uh, and it becomes progressively smaller and smaller, and, and you can see here these, the alternating passes. Hmm? So first the material gets deformed in this direction, yes? and then in this direction, etc. Hmm? And you can end up with you know, a, a very small cross-section um, with uh, you know, a very long length. Yes? And you have a wire, basically. Hmm? See here again, cross-sectional changes uh, in a uh, wire mill in the, in the, roughing, in the roughing part of the, of the mill. Hmm? And here again, the shape change as you go through the, um, uh, the mill, hmm? okay? And it depends very much on what the starting, what are you using for at, at the start also. Hmm? If you have, you can start with square billets, you can start with round billets, yeah? Uh, it, and it all depends also on the product you're making. Uh, some uh, wire products need to be uh, square, others need to be round. Uh, it, it depends on the application. Hmm? Right. Um, the, uh, so these, uh, you go through an intermediate mill, yes? Uh, again, that, that's pretty much the same as the, the roughing mill. 
Um, and then at the, at the end, you, ha you get a finishing mill, right, where you really set up the, what will be the final dimensions of, of your, uh, your product. Yeah? So, so that is a, uh, a, a much higher uh, um, accuracy uh, process. Hmm? And uh, again, uh, there are uh, different processes here. You can have uh, a uh, sizing mill, yes, that will give that that looks like this. It's basically um, a, a, a two roll uh, passes, yes. And uh, more and more, you get to get these uh, very uh, high uh, accuracy get in your the sizing of your final product. You have these three roll uh, passes, yes. And um, so two cons consecutive rolls are, uh, these three rolls are oriented in the uh, Y position and then the next one in, in the upside down Y position so that uh, you end up having a, uh, a perfectly uh, round product. The reason why you change this is when you have uh, so when you, you're rolling something, for instance, with um, rolls that look this shape, obviously you're not rolling this part here, right? So there will always be a little bulge, yes? Hmm? So if you have two rolls, uh, the, the next roll will be in this direction. Hmm? And in this direction, so you, can, you can remove this, this, this little bulging uh, places. Uh, the, the, the th when you do with a, a three uh, roll situation, like this, you also get little bulges here. I exaggerate them very much, right? Uh, they're not that huge, right? Uh, you get these bulges. So the next uh, stand is, is rotated by 120 degrees, so the, the rolls are now oriented like this. Right? So you, you get rid of this little bulge yes, in the product. Um, right, and you see here what, uh, how these, um, uh, the shape of the, um, the uh, bar, uh, the wire changes as you, as you roll it. And here you have an example of this uh, uh, mail uh, it's a German company that's very famous in making these, uh, they're called Cox, and that's, and very often these um, uh, reducing and sizing mills are called Cox mills. Um, important also in this, um, in, a, in a wire mill is of course, because you have all these stands, yes, uh, the tension control is very important. Yeah? And just like we discussed in the case of the hot strip mill, uh, you have to control the tension and the f uh, in the strip and also the flow of the material through all these stands. Yes? And, and if you don't do that, uh, well, you, know, you end up with cobbles, yes? which can be, of course, a very you know, terrible thing when suddenly uh, the you know, the, uh, uh, the wire starts spouting out from between two stands because there is this instability in, in the material flow. So, um, so th this control and automation of these lines will, of course, avoid this problem. Um, it will make sure that we have the right finishing temperature. Remember, we do all the processing of these uh, 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 low carbon uh, wire steel products in the austenite phase, yes? Um, we make sh sure so that we have the temperature is high enough at all times. Uh, we make sure we have the required diameter and shape of uh, the product and then of course no cobbles here. There you know, different setups uh, to, uh, to design the, the, the wire mill. And um, you can have a look at some of these uh, designs. And um, this slide is about the, um, the 
the control. But let's let's just have a look at uh, what comes out of a, a a wire mill. Yes. So you can you can make a huge amount of uh, different products you know, with um, these uh, these mills. And this is an example here of the um, the, uh, the intermediate and the uh, finishing. So intermediate and finishing rolling schedule for a typical uh, 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 mill that makes um, engineering steels, spring steels, bearing steels, and tool steels um, in wire form. And so you, you start with a product that's uh, about um, 11 centimeters in, in uh, diameter, yes? And you can produce anywhere from uh, here, so this is uh, a large diameter, 75 millimeters, so 7.5 uh, centimeters, uh, down to about uh, 20 millimeters, right? So a very large uh, number of uh, uh, dimensions. And of course, each, for each dimension, there is a very specific route to follow. Right, and uh, and that's why it's important, uh, and 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 so you need to have um, for e every single one of these steps, you need to have the right uh, rolls in the right stand at a specific time. Yes, and of course, uh, because we're talking about uh, hot forming, uh, the roll surfaces will be subject to wear. Yes, and degradation, so you will need to uh, 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 correct the surface problems yes, uh, uh, frequently, you know, and then put these, so there's a big management of roles in these uh, wire mills and bar mills. You know? um, there are also variants of, of products. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have uh, one single uh, strip of material, yes? Uh, there are some uh, situations where uh, people try to increase the productivity of, uh, of a bar mill, for instance, yes? Um, where instead of having a, uh, a round wire, you have kind of a flat wire, yes? yes? Uh, out of which uh, this, this splitting unit will be able to cut three, uh, three wires, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and this allows uh, large production of, of smaller rebar sizes. This kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't call it a, 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 a low quality material, but it's, it's, it's rebar, it's so uh, reinforcement bars that you use uh, in connection to, uh, with construction. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and, and this allows you to uh, uh, um, uh, produce, have a higher productivity. Hmm? So, uh, again, um, our material goes through uh, thermomechanical processes as uh, in the line. You know, we, uh, we, we reheat uh, our billets. We, uh, we in, in the case, we have big uh, billets, we will have breakdown mills. Usually, that's not uh, very critical lately because of the continuous casting. So you go through, in modern mills, through roughing mills, intermediate mills, finishing mills, and then you can have these sizing uh, blocks that uh, uh, so you, so that you get the, the, the right dimensions of, and final dimensions of your wire product. So you have to make sure, yes, that um, you finish above the, uh, uh, the transformation temperature, hmm? the AR, uh, the so-called AR3 temperature. So you process the material entirely in the austenite uh, phase range. Hmm? And, and then you cool, you, you cool the material yeah? in a controlled manner, yes? Uh, we'll see in a moment that 
uh, this, the cooling rates are very important because many of these products, uh, wire products, have relatively high carbon compositions and are very often perlitic in terms of their microstructure. And by controlling the, um, the cooling rate, we're able to control the refinement of the, uh, the perlites and, and hence its strength and uh, other mechanical properties. Hmm? Having said this, um, because we have uh, products uh, of certain uh, dimensions, um, when uh, uh, the, um, the material gets processed, the, uh, the surface layer will always be cooler than the interior, yes? And when you roll, yes, you will have adiabatic heating, just the same way we had with uh, the, um, uh, the strip uh, product. So you can see here, uh, if this is the mean temperature of your material as you go through the line, yes, so this is, would be the, uh, the deformations here, yes, at the surface, you, s you see that each time you do rolling steps, the, the surface gets cooler, yes? Uh, but the interior gets hotter, yes? And so this is adiabatic uh, heating, and this is uh, surface cooling, basically. Hmm? Okay. And then we have uh, here, when you come out, yes, you have the regular cooling steps, yes? Uh, that we use to get the strip to the right temperature, yes? And then you see something interesting. You don't cool down all the way to room temperature, but you keep the temperature constant, yes? And that temperature is, uh, if you see here, uh, allows us to do, um, uh, to, to get the strip at the right temperature to do the perlite transformation. Hmm? We'll see in a moment. We'll see that in a moment. Okay, all right. So when we uh, and, and this the right temperature depends on the chemistry of your steel. Hmm? So let's let's have a look here uh, at what I mean um, for uh, what we call cold heading qualities. Cold heading qualities are steels that are used to make fasteners. And fasteners are bolts. Uh, nuts and bolts, uh, um, uh, uh, nails, things like this. Huh? So um, they will have a, a carbon content between 0.3 and 0.5. Huh? These cold heading qualities. Huh? So uh, the material after the, uh, the, the manufacturing, the forming of the wire when it comes out of the sizing mill huh? uh, is say cooled yes all right so if we uh, uh, cool it hmm? uh, so in principle hmm? uh, let me draw this a little bit better yeah okay all right. so what what happens is you know, if i cool slowly yes the transformation starts here, yeah, the t this temperature, yes, and is finished at this temperature. Hmm? Okay, yeah, so this would be for one degree per second, for instance. All right. As I increase the cooling speed, yeah, lot, yeah, the the temperature at which the transformation starts, the AR three temperature, is reduced. Yes, hmm? and this is for ten degrees per second. This is for fifty degrees per second. And uh, so you, you, you see that I can get an appreciable uh, lowering of transformation start with cooling. But the other thing that's really important to realize is that uh, this diagram here, that's our equilibrium phase diagram, right? Once you start cooling down with you know, uh, these cooling rates, uh, you know, t uh, 1050, the transformations start at temperatures that are much, much lower 
than the ones that are predicted by the phase diagram. So for instance, the phase diagram tells me here at 800 degrees C, I should start to make ferrite. Okay, that's what the diagram says. But obviously, it takes much longer, lower temperatures rather, uh, before that transformation starts. And by uh, getting this transformation at lower temperature, I also refine the microstructure. Because uh, as you reduce the temperature, uh, the driving force for transformation becomes very large, and you get lots of nuclei. Hmm? Lots of nuclei mean I get uh, refinement. So if we look at the material uh, now, when I do this transformation, okay, uh, and say we, um, uh, so this is a temperature scale, the same temperature scale. So this would be 800. This is uh, distance or time, if you want. Um, you see, uh, sorry, for 50 here. This is for a, a fast cooling rate, yes. I see that, the, I can see that the transformation starts here. Why can I see that the transformation starts? Because there is this phenomenon of, recal this is called recalescence. Recalescence means the material heats up during the transformation, yes? Uh, and that is because uh, you get a release of the heat of transformation. And when, you, uh, when you heat up uh, from gamma alpha to gamma, you have to provide heat to do the transformation. When you cool down from gamma to alpha, the material heats up. So you get this recalescence phenomena, yes? Okay. And if you uh, look at the uh, situation with the, uh, uh, the phase fractions here, you see that uh, there is a slight amount of ferrite formation uh, before you reach this recalescence point. That's obviously due to the formation of this, uh, this pro-eutectoid ferrite, yes? And then uh, this recalescence actually corresponds to this uh, uh, formation of this very fine uh, perlite, okay? Okay. Now, um, how these, these uh, cooling rates, uh, how do they impact our uh, microstructure? Hmm? So, let's look at a steel uh, with uh, this composition here, so very close to the, the, the higher end of these uh, cold heading steel qualities. And um, let's see the different cooling rates that we have. So this would be, um, for instance, at, you would attach this graph you would obtain if you attach a thermocouple to a specimen, for instance, right? You'd, you'd see that it, and you would do forced air cooling. Hmm? Forced air cooling is um, you have the material lies on some kind of tray Yes, and you, and you pump air through this tray so it, it cools down by airflow. Hmm? So you get about 10 degrees, 9 degrees per second. Hmm? So what you see, the temperature as a function of time uh, decreases. Yeah? Uh, when I reach the, about the temperature of the perl perlite formation, yes, I get the recalescence phenomena, which tells me the transformation has started, and then it cools down. Hmm? Um, the... Um, uh, uh, mean, uh, uh, so you, you can see that the, the cooling temperature is not a constant here, right? But we can define a mean uh, uh, temperature of transformation in this case. And um, so let's say it would be about midway here. So that's about 650. So a forced air cooling my mean transformation temperature would be uh, yeah, here, 650. Yeah. So I find a certain tensile strength of the material, which is related to the, 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 the grain size of, or the colony size, if you want, of the perlite. I can also do a different type of cooling, and, uh, which is called uh, patenting. Yeah. And in this case, what you basically do is uh, you dunk the wire in lead, yes? It's a way of cooling at uh, uh, 
of, of wire that's very uh, uh, convenient because the, the lead doesn't stick to the steel. So it's like having a warm water bath hmm, that doesn't evaporate, basically. Hmm? And it's very stable. It doesn't oxidize or anything. So you can actually use it to, to cool, yes? Um, so what happens here? Uh, and because there's very intimate, very good intimate contact between the wire and the, the lead, yes, um, we get uh, much higher cooling rates of the order of 20 degrees per second. You can see here that the transformation, uh, perlite transformation starts at much lower temperatures. Yes, you can see it here. Yes. And in this case, I guess we have about 600 or something. Yes, 610 or, yeah. And uh, our strength is, is much larger. It's above 1,100 uh, megapascal. And so the, the, the reason why this, this is is because we basically refined the microstructure. And uh, achieving a very fine perlite is important to if we have an application that requires uh, ultra high strength. And, and one of the ac uh, application is, for instance, tire cord, which is used to reinforce uh, co uh, uh, tires of um, passenger cars and trucks. So if I, um, for instance, if I can reduce the uh, uh, interlamellar spacing to about a tenth of a micron, yes, I can achieve very high drawing strengths, yes, and uh, and as a consequence, very high cold rolling strengths of the steel. You see here, I can easily get uh, 2.6 gigapascal by basically uh, continuing the reduction of the, uh, or the refinement of this uh, perlite, perlitic microstructure uh, by drawing, by wire drawing. Hmm? Uh, and, and that's not the case if I have a much lower uh, in, um, interlamellar spacing. Now, how, how is this being done? Because you have to imagine uh, this uh, production unit producing you know, hundreds of meters of wire at very high rates, yes? And you need to control the, uh, the cooling rate accurately. Yeah, so you can, you, your properties remain constant yeah, within this wire that can be, you know, kilometers long. Yeah. All right, so um, what, what we do hmm, is uh, uh, nowadays you have this so-called Stelmore uh, uh, processing. Hmm? And um, what we basically do is we turn the wire into rings, yes, with a, uh, a ring forming uh, machine here, yes. You can see that, so let's see, the, so the, the, the finishing mill, yeah, produces the wire, yes, and then I have water cooling boxes that bring the wire to the right temperature. Hmm? And then we have a, uh, so a, a, a wire making machine uh, which makes these circles, makes this spiral, turns this a straight wire into a spiral and uh, lays it down on a bed, yes? And this bed has a, is a moving bed. So this, uh, this spiral, hmm? Uh, goes, travels on this moving bed, yes? And this uh, bed has a uh, open bottom, yes? On which uh, these uh, rings are lying, yeah? And uh, below the bottom you have fans that uh, do the forced air cooling, yeah? So you can see here this, uh, what this actually is, is a spiral of this wire, yes? 
and in, below here there is a ventilator, big ventilator, that will give me the cooling. Okay. So, um, so we cool uh, after the finishing mill to any temperature we need between 750 and 960, depending on the application. Uh, then this rod of this wire is put down into rings um, and on, uh, by a, a ring forming mechanism and, uh, and this ring forming mechanism also lays down this uh, spiral on the cooling <coughs> area. And then you have this cooling area is a, is a fan air cooling hmm? and it cools the, these overlapping rings in continuously hmm? over a conveyor belt. Hmm? So you, and you can adjust the cooling rates to get the microstructure that you need for steel grade. Hmm? Okay? And at the end of this you uh, form a coil yes, uh, and um, and that's basically the, the end of your uh, process in the simplest case. Hmm? The, the advantage of this is that you can produce wire that can be processed directly. For instance, in the case you want to make tire cord. Yes? The, the uh, manufacturer of tire cord does not necessarily have to go through a lot of extra heat cycles to get the right perlytic microstructure, for instance. Hmm? Uh, the strength is lower, that was one of the advantages if you, if you need to uh, draw the material. Hmm? And again, uh, you get improvement of microstructure through refining uh, and strength. You can also uh, apply some micro-alloying concepts. So this is the picture of this laying head, the wire rings on the conveyor belt. And uh, uh, some lines are also equipped with uh, covers. So you can uh, slow down the cooling rate um, or increase it by closing or opening the, um, these covers on top of the uh, uh, conveyor. Hmm? So uh, and by the end of the, the, this conveyor belt is quite long, right? Uh, at the beginning, uh, the wire is red hot. Towards the end, it's, it looks like this. It's cooled down. You put it on a uh, coil reforming cylinder and, uh, and, and it's taken out as these uh, bundles of um, coiled uh, wire, which is, which is then shipped to uh, customers. Hmm? Um, these, uh, so, so you have uh, products uh, like wires, which you can basically put in bundles, but you also have bar products and bar products uh, are used for very different applications hmm? the technology we use the mills we use are very similar look very similar to uh, wires except their section is larger and you can't really bend them into uh, bundles and in many cases you don't want to bundle them into um, um, uh, wound bundles because of, because of the application. Hmm? So uh, bars, hmm? um, processing, it's slightly different, yes. Um, also because the, uh, in comparison to uh, wire applications, we're talking about slightly more demanding applications and higher end applications. Hmm? For instance, uh, uh, crankshafts for motor cars yes, are, are made from bar. Um, uh, so what you do with the bar, the, the starting material is just the same starting material as a uh, for a wire uh, mill. You, you basically have a round or square or rectangular billets, yes, which you uh, heat, hmm, and then you roll the material. Uh, uh, they are then uh, annealed and uh, pre-aligned. In the case of bar, the importance of uh, uh, the requirements in terms of uh, surface finish, in terms of dimensional accuracy uh, and, and surface conditions, straightness, etc., is, is very important. 
you, you have a process, for instance, that we don't see with wire uh, is uh, bar peeling. Uh, that's, a, that's a process whereby you remove oxide uh, or this so-called shell skin, the, the skin that's, uh, that was cooled down a bit faster. The surface cracks and this is done to achieve dimensional accuracy and high surface quality. Bar straightening is also carried out. It's something you don't, you know, it's never applied on, on wire. Hmm? Uh, and the reason is because we want to have a straight bar. Hmm? Uh, you balance stresses and strains resulting from this peeling process. That's basically uh, what you do. Hmm? The bar may be slightly bent because of the peeling process. You need to straighten it again. Hmm? Then uh, many uh, applications, um, the end of your bar needs to have specific shape, yes? Um, and we call the process of taking care of this, this the end bits of the, uh, the bars, chamfering and end facing. Hmm? Wire is usually not tested 100%, yes? Bar products are very often tested, 100% of the production is fully tested ultrasonically and the reason why it's being done is to uh, look for cracks and imperfections and then of course the bar gets marked yes and if the application requires this there'll be even a, uh, a special final grinding of the uh, the surface um, for demanding applications so this is an example here of uh, Peeling, yes. Um, this this all goes very fast, right? The peeling is actually it's a special tool, yes, that turns very quickly and uh, basically removes um, a special machine tool that removes the surface layer yeah, at high speed. So you, you see, it's, it's in this machine here. There is a turning head with carbide uh, cutting tools that will give you a bright surface bar. Yes, that's taken through this machine. So you see these bright bars here. Um, so you remove oxides, and, and what comes out is, is something that has very good um, uh, dimensional quality hmm? and surface finished. Hmm? And we also very often uh, in this process remove the decarburized layer. Hmm? Very often these bar products will, will be products that are more alloyed steels, yes? Uh, it's a little bit more complex in chemistry than the wire steels, which tend to be basically pearlitic steels. Hmm? Uh, so there is always a little bit of decarburizing at the surface. We remove this in this uh, bar peeling process. Hmm? Uh, right. Uh, so we, we, this can be done very uh, with high feeding rates because there will be multiple uh, tool heads, yes? Uh, and because you do this peeling in, diff in, sm in small steps, there's uh, less vibrations, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you don't remove much. We're talking about, you know, less than 100 microns of material remover. Then uh, in some cases, uh, the, the, the bar can be uh, extended, made longer by, uh, by drawing it through a, um, or with a spinner block, or if, if the section is uh, small, a bit uh, smaller side, you can do rod drawing. Hmm? Because the, uh, the, the sections tend to be rather large in drawing, uh, there is a danger for uh, formation of so-called internal defects in, the, in, this, in these bars as they get drawn, yes? And they're called chevron defects. And on the exterior, you don't see anything, yes? The, the material looks perfectly drawn. Inside the material, they, they, you will see these, these cracks. Obviously, uh, that's a very bad sign, yes? It's due to the fact that when you draw these rather uh, heavy sections, 
yes? Uh, there is a risk that, uh, so close to the, uh, the tool, the draw the tool, there is a lot of plastic deformation as you draw, uh, but there is a risk that there is a central zone, so-called dead zone, yes, where uh, there's no deformation, yes, or very little. And, uh, and then you get these chevron uh, marks, yes. They're internal defects, and this is one of the, one of the big reasons why uh, uh, bar products are so heavily uh, checked during production, hmm? because there's, uh, uh, certainly if they're drawn products, uh, you get this type of internal defects and you want to make sure uh, they don't get into your production. This, this dead zone is uh, a function of the, the geometry, of course, that we use, the angle of drawing and the amount of deformation. Uh, the amount of deformation is, so it, it sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but if you have these cracks, one of the ways to avoid them is to increase the amount of deformation rather than decrease. Right, so, so that to make sure uh, there is no dead zone in um, uh, the um, uh, straightening uh, very important in bars. Uh, you've got you've got different types of straightener for bars. Yes, uh, you have if, if for bars you can round bars you can use rounded. Uh, rolls here. Hmm? So the, uh, the material goes through this and spins and is slightly bended back and forth. Yeah? Like you would do, uh, you know, if you ever worked with a paper clip and you open a paper clip, it's like this, right? And if you want, you can make actually very straight and what you will do automatically is, is you can bend it a little bit, right? Back and forth and eventually you'll get it perfectly straight. Uh, well, that's basically what the straightening machine does, right? It bends uh, the bar uh, back and forth. Now, you can do this with rolls, right? And this is what's done with this bar straightener, uh, with these rounded uh, rolls, yes? But if you have a profile, a square profile, you need, uh, you need uh, these flat rolls that will bend, actually bend, the, the bar back and forth. And uh, this is, of course, not really applicable to, um, to bars, but you have the same type of machines for uh, tube straightening. Once you have this bar that's uh, perfectly straight, you go to chamfering and end finishing. Hmm? What does this chamfering uh, mean? Well, it means this, you, know, you may need the end part of this uh, tube, for instance, here, yes, is uh, is, is not flat, it's, um, there is a, a certain angle to it that's called chamfering, and then making it flat here, that's um, the end finishing. Maybe you want to uh, weld, maybe able to weld these uh, bars to something else, then you, you, uh, you do this kind of things. Hmm? The uh, typical uh, uh, testing methods you have basically two, yes. Uh, obviously, you know, if you're in research, testing for uh, surface problems or inter interior problems, that's, you know, you'd say, well, you know, you put it in an SEM and you'll see all the defects you need to see or you make a, a, a metallurgical cross-section. Uh, but in productions, you don't use these methods. You have to use methods that are fast, efficient, yes, and, uh, and reliable, right? And so the, the two methods uh, that we are using is, uh, are, are shown here is eddy current testing, yes? And ultrasound testing, yes? And uh, in the case of uh, uh, eddy current testing, you basically uh, look at surface defects. Hmm? And in the case of ultrasound testing, you look at interior defects. Hmm? And, um, and again, you have to do this at a very high rate hmm? so, th so that 100% of the, the production is controlled. Yes? So you have uh, these uh, automated uh, production units. Hmm? Nowadays, 
you have uh, also, be, because nowadays we have computers, yes, that, uh, that can do visual inspection, you see these systems uh, more coming into use more and more because you can have an aut automatic visual inspection which also recognizes defects, yes? Uh, but in general, uh, you'll see eddy current testing as, as the main uh, way to look at uh, surface defects. Rod and bar mills or wire and bar mills are, are, are some of the, you know, the fastest production units you will see in, uh, in steel production, right? So in, in, in comparison to strip finishing, the, the strain rates you get are, go easily beyond 100 to 1,000 per second, right? So you, the, the production rates of these uh, units is very, is very high. Hmm? Okay, so um, the, uh, let me say a few things about uh, production of uh, products, of specific products. Uh, th 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 there is some, yes, yeah. This slide is just to remind you of the fact that some ideas, I, I don't think we'll go into this too much, but the idea of using thermomechanical processing, you know, can ob obviously also be used for wire and bar products, right? if you want, in particular, when you want to refine the microstructure. Hmm? Uh, okay, but let's, let's now f focus on wire uh, products. Hmm? So th the main uh, five uh, Types of products are tire cord, uh, cold heading quality steels, spring steels, bearing steels, and free cutting steels. And, and here you have typical products. Um, tire cord is, is used in uh, uh, steel belts of um, tires. Cold heading qualities, we mean basically nuts and bolts, yes? Spring steels, this is what we mean. This is a, a suspension spring here. Bearing steel, very, very uh, important uh, part of any moving machinery that is made with uh, 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 wire uh, steel. And then smaller parts, yes, that need machining, uh, like this one here, uh, coupling uh, for um, gas line uh, is, is made with what we call free cutting steel. Um, what's important here, of course, with tire cord strength, cold heading quality strength and hardenability, because some of these uh, uh, fasteners must have very high and well-defined mechanical properties. Hmm? Uh, spring steel, obviously, fatigue resistance will be important. Bearing steels, durability, that is... Um, also in fatigue uh, conditions. And free cutting steels, obviously, if you, make, you need to make this part starting from a wire, you need form, uh, not formability, but machinability. Hmm? And in all the cases, cleanliness is, uh, steel cleanliness is extremely important. Hmm? Okay? When we come to bar products, yes, our products basically look the same. You have a you know, long, piece of metal that's uh, cylindrical, uh, but we make very different things with bars. Uh, shafts, in particular crank shafts, gears. Gears are made with um, bar products. Induction hardenable steels for heat treatments. Hmm? A big application for bars is the stabilizing uh, bar in, uh, in, in uh, um, transport, and then heavy springs, yes? The springs, uh, you may have looked, uh, seen the springs of, for instance, the KTX train, yes? They're huge springs. They're not made with wire steel. They're made with bar steel, very heavy uh, springs, hmm? okay? Um, so what do we, uh, so this is an example here of a crankshaft, hmm? Uh, example here of a um, gear. Uh, here, this is a also machined or forged part for automotive. This is a, a stabilizing part. Yes, 
um, which is hot formed and oil quenched. It's it's so it's it's um, uh, heat treated. Yes, and then the the heavy springs are are uh, formed, oil quenched, quenched and tempered and cold formed, uh, and you see some applications here. So again, what is important in these applications is uh, shaft, of course, machinability, strength, fatigue resistance, and steel cleanliness. Carburized gears, we, obviously we need to make these things, right? So machinability is important. Strength, hardenability will be very important because we, you know, we, we want to make a very hard uh, uh, gear here. Hmm? High strength gear, um, cleanliness, steel cleanliness, and grain and size control. Um, for these induction hardenable steels, fatigue is very important, yes. Wear resistance and cleanliness. Stabilizing bar, of obviously, uh, durability and steel cleanliness. And the heavy springs, fatigue resistance and, and cleanliness is a major importance. Um, this is an example here of uh, situations you, you don't want to encounter, yes. Um, this is a fractured uh, crankshaft, and this is another, uh, another shaft, um, uh, also I think automotive or, or of a truck. Uh, and, and in this case, you, get, uh, you can see the, the shaft has broken, and you can see this is a fatigue type of crack, yes. And this is a torsional fatigue uh, uh, situation, uh, even though you can see here this flat part of the, the fracture here, even though we have a, um, a, a surface hardened uh, uh, part. Yes? In or, one of the reasons is to avoid uh, fracture, hmm? fatigue fractures. Uh, you can still get quite serious uh, problems with, with fatigue. Yeah? All right. um, now, I'm not going to go through all this uh, uh, chemistry here. Uh, instead, we'll just go through, see a few examples, yes? Um, but um, have a look at, at the chemistries and um, uh, you will see, for instance, that um, some of these uh, steels, like, for instance, the bearing steel here, yes, have high chromium contents, okay? So that tells you already that um, that that steel will be heat treated yes because um, we add chromium at that type of level uh, to do um, to get um, uh, strengthening uh, to control the transformation and, and to make the material hardenable hmm? uh, by and large however you see that for these wire steels uh, there's not many, uh, this is for welding rods, um, th there's not much in terms of alloying. Here and there you see, for instance, alloy steel to make high strength bolts and nuts. We see 1.2% of chromium, again, to make it hardenable. But most of the time, and molybdenum, same thing, make material hardenable. Most of the time we see mainly carbon and some chromium. Yes, in uh, the chemistry of these wire steels. Okay, so relatively simple chemistries, and uh, but the carbon content can be um, can be quite high. And for instance, tire cord, spring steel, bearing steels. We're very close to uh, perlitic compositions and beyond perlitic compositions. Hmm? Okay, so uh, I'm going to. Uh, this is the uh, processing for wire rod. Um, I, I want to go focus on uh, actual uh, applications. Um, so what is also important is that um, these type of products, the, the wire products, can achieve the, some of the highest uh, strengths um, of all steel products. For instance, these are all the steel products. Many of them are have strength levels that are below a uh, thousand gigapascal, uh, but uh, it's very common to have uh, bridge 
uh, for suspension bridges, right? You have a bridge wire that is, comes close to 2,000 uh, giga, uh, 2 gigapascal, and steel cord easily uh, up to uh, 3 and f even 4 gigapascal. Hmm? So the wire products are, are some of the, the very, very high strength materials. Hmm? Okay? And everything, uh, or, or a lot of it, in, in these products is due to the refining of the microstructure, hmm? the refining of the, uh, the, the reducing of the distance between the, the cementite uh, lamella. Hmm? So the, um, remember, we'll see that some of the compositions of these wire products um, are not, are not, eutectic, eutectoid composition, right? So if I, if I look at the, uh, at my phase diagram, hmm? for instance, in this case, uh, here, uh, so around 0.77 carbon is the eutectic composition. Now, you, the eutectic composition is not the only composition where we get a perlytic microstructure. In fact, um, the uh, uh, temperature temperature uh, composition range, yes, where we get a perlytic microstructure, even for compositions that are not equal to perlytic composition, is given by the extension. So this, this line here is called the ACM line, and this is called the AE3 line, uh, equilibrium lines, AECM, yes. Uh, if we extend these two to lower temperatures, yes, yes, um, Of course, it doesn't go uh, all the way down, um, and w we go to about the BS temperature. About the uh, then within this range, I can make a fully perlytic microstructure with with the composition that's uh, here or there. Doesn't hmm? hmm? And the reason is. The reason is is that in the, in in order to grow perlite, yes, I have to have carbon arrive at the top of the uh, the cementite. The, there must be a carbon flux to this place, yeah? So there must be, okay, uh, so this is, so this would be austenite, yes, during the transformation, right? And, and here I have ferrite, cementite, ferrite, cementite. Hmm? Hmm? And what I need to have is carbon flux which should go this way, yeah? Hmm? And, yes, during the transformation. Hmm? So if, I, if I'm below this temperature, yes, for instance at this temperature here, I need to have a situation where the composition here, yes, in front here, and the composition here is such carbon composition that there is a flux of carbon in the austenite, yes, from this place to this place. So this is the carbon content, yes, here is the carbon content at the, uh, let me see that I write it correctly, at the alpha gamma interface. And here is the carbon content, oops, carbon content at the theta or, or cementite gamma interface. Yes? Yes? Now, when I draw this phase diagram, where are these? 
when I do the transformation at this temperature, remember, you know, a wire comes out of the process of uh, finishing, and then I'm cooling it down, and then I'm making uh, perlite, yes? Uh, I need to, the perlite, I, you know, I'll, I, I don't make the perlite at the A1 temperature, I go below, yes? Where does the phase diagram tell me that the carbon content at the gamma, at the uh, cementite austenite is, and where is the carbon content at the ferrite austenite? Well, that's why I draw this extension here. Yes? Because what, what is this here? This is nothing else than this line tells me the carbon content at the interface between austenite and cementite. Yeah? So if I extend this below room temperature, yes, I, I'm ba this basically will tell me this is the carbon content at the cementite austenite interface at temperatures be you know, below the uh, eutectoid temperature. Same here, what is here is tells me what is the carbon content on the austenite side, on the austenite side of the ferrite austenite boundary, yes? At this temperature, of course, the phase diagram doesn't show me this, right? But if I extend this line, yes, I can find it. This is, this is carbon content at the alpha austenite grain boundary. Hmm? And you can see, yes, right? This is larger than this, right? So this is larger than, th than this, right? So the, the carbon will move, will diffuse from the tip of the ferrite lap to the tip of the perlite of the, of the um, cementite uh, lap, huh? okay? So any composition here, yes? Any carbon composition and temperature combination, yes? That is within this triangle will allow me to have a stable perlite growth. Huh? But if I'm above this point, like here, you know, I'll get ferrite, basically. Hmm? Gonna, if I'm here, I'll, I'll basically get um, cementite, hmm? things like that. Okay. okay so, um, So the, 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 if you do the uh, uh, perlite transformation here, what's important to remember in the pure situation, right? In the pure situation of uh, when, you, when you have the eutectoid transformation, it's a very fast transformation, right? That's why going to the eutectoid transformation temperature quickly is important, yes? Because if, I, if you look at the kinetics of this transformation, it takes about, you know, one second. Um, you, you know, if you go from 900 to uh, 600, yes, you have to be very fast, yes, in your cooling rate, right? Um, and this is where you have a maximum uh, transformation rate. Hmm? That's around 600. Okay, 650, 600. And, and that's the place where you want to do your transformation or slightly below that to, to get a very fine uh, perlytic microstructure. All right, so it's a quarter past 11. And I guess I should stop here and we'll continue on uh, Wednesday. Thank you for your attention.